Come on in, everyone. Feel free to ask me questions if you have any. So nobody has any questions? We're early. We've got about six minutes left before class starts. Like I said, you're welcome to ask me any questions you might have. Check out me looking all fancy. <laughs> Yeah, five minutes before class starts. Let me see. Professor? Yes. Um I just wanted to remind you that you were you were giving me time to take the test. Oh yeah, uh, test two. Is this James? Uh, yeah. I yes, for uh, for this weekend. Yeah, complete. Ah, oh, Jesus. Yeah, I even have it right here. All right, and that was test two, right? Yes. Let me do it right quick. Uh, well, I still got you on here, or else I'll screw it like I did last time. Whoa, I'm <laughs> sorry about that, but. It's all right. I am going to open it back up. Let's do that. Uh, will Friday be enough time, or do you need some weekend? Oh, uh, the weekend would be better. Okay. I'll make it. Uh, you have till 1159 on 26th. Thank you. No problem. Sorry about that. It's all right. Uh, let me look at other things, see if I have any other students that might need some help. Just so I can be you know, fair and all that good stuff. Like everybody did pretty well. Uh, I see a couple students that didn't take it and a couple students that didn't do well. Uh, if you folks want to request, I'll certainly give you an extension. So by all means, consider doing that. And uh, I'll just let you look at your own grade for test two, chapters three and four. Uh, there's one other person that completely missed, actually two other people, you know, yeah, two other people that completely missed and then two people that just didn't do very well. So, uh, here's your opportunity. If you'd like to improve that score, uh, 
looks like everybody else got really, really pretty high scores. So. Anybody else have any questions? Um, I had a few questions about the midterm. Um, first one, are we taking it like in class, like at campus or? Uh, last semester, I, I did it. I allowed y'all to do it during lab. I don't think I'm going to get y'all to do it this time during lab because uh, your lab instructors probably got enough stuff going on. Uh, so the plan was you'd actually do it uh, as a proctored test during your la regular meeting time. So like I'd, I'd allow you to start up to, you know, 25 minutes early, say, uh, so you can start at like say five or 450 or something like that. Or you could run late because I want you to be able to have plenty of time to do it. Uh, but we'll do it online. You'll just have to use a proctor. Uh, basically, Respondus Lockdown Browser will work uh, along with Respondus Monitor. If you don't have a camera or any of that stuff that needs to do that, then you have to take it at the testing center. And I'll have to make a separate version for you, for anybody that does that, just because uh, everybody needs to take the same exam on the same day. <laughs> okay, and then uh, my other question about the midterm were, was, um, what were the specific requirements for our formula sheets? Uh, Basically, my rule is any equation within the textbook that's numbered is fair game. Uh, I don't mind you having single or couple words saying that omega is or m is the mass or f is the mass uh, force or something like that. Uh, but not, no whole sentences or anything like that. You're, you know, you, for instance, one of the chucker questions we sometimes throw in is state Newton uh, Newton's three laws of motion in order. Uh, obviously, if you had this written down as Newton's first law, this written down as Newton's second law, and this one was third, uh, that sort of defeats the purpose of that. So you can't do stuff like that. Uh, you just have to have the. Uh, you only are allowed to have the actual equations. Uh, that are numbered. Uh, other than that, there are equations that I could possibly uh, have told you was okay. Like, I think I might have told you that one of the equations I derived for projectile motion was acceptable. That would be fine. But that's the only rules, really. Okay. And then, like, as far as it, like, the size of the page, it's just like a regular, like, printer page? I, yeah, uh, I don't, one I don't side only or print multiple back? pages. Uh, when you're doing the actual proctor's exam, all the paper you have in your workstation, you've got to show front and back, you know, so I don't mind if you actually have multiple pages, it's fine. You just have to take uh, the camera with the respondus monitor and you got to, if it's like your computer screen, you got to hold it up and show basically uh, what's all in your workspace within lungeable distance, even if, if you have anything down here or whatever. Uh, show that, and then you're going to pick up each sheet of paper and show me both sides. Of course, you're also going to hold up a photo ID next to your face so we can verify that you are indeed the person on the photo ID who's registered for the class, that sort of stuff. Okay, thank you. No problem. Is it also possible can we... to have the practice test available? <laughs> Uh, yes, I can open that up for you as well. Uh, someone was getting ready to ask a question. Go ahead, go for it if you'd like. I wanted to ask if we can make a drawing uh, to explain the formula on the sheet. Uh, yeah, drawing should be fine. I don't have a problem with that. All right. <laughs> All right, let's see what I can do about this. There it is. We were just asking questions about the upcoming exam. Uh huh. Yeah, they were asking the questions about the midterm. We've got online tests, of course, before then. And actually, that's part of the thing I was checking when uh, you guys came in is I wanted to double check the syllabus. I think I think I got to the point where I found out the syllabus was, in fact, correct. Uh, on one syllabus, I actually used the wrong dates for our spring break. 
So I'm trying to check the syllabus now to find out that I whether or not I did that. It looks like I got the right one. The fifth through the twelfth is our spring break, and I had originally planned on you guys taking uh, taking the midterm before the spring break. You see. Uh, we're about three minutes into class time now. I'm sure, you're taking a while to get this. Professor? Yes. You said it was the March 1st, right? For the. Midterm. Yeah, I said May, actually. But May, uh, you mean far as the final goes, the midterm goes? Yeah, 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 the midterm. It's March 1st, right? And we can take it 40 minutes prior or 45 minutes yeah, prior and, or something. So if I make it, uh, if I make it a full two hour test, then I allow you to take it like you can start up the 40 minutes early or finish up the 40 minutes late, but you get the total amount of time that you get and that's it. So yeah, I had it on evidently 229 was what the midterm was, which would be literally nine days from today. Uh, okay. I, and there's, go ahead. There, there's no uh, like kind of like similar to the practice test for the online test. There's no like practice exam that we. There can will take. be. I put that up. I usually put that up at least seven days in advance. So it should be coming up soon. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. And chat. As someone asked, chapter five conceptual was due last night. Uh, basically, I gave you a extended period of time for all that uh, stuff, and ex uh, basically, I extended chapter five conceptual a little bit beyond uh, what I'd done for the homework. So that's that's why I'm in it that way. We have finished actually chapter six. Uh, now, uh, actually, let me see. No, we haven't finished chapter six. We finished chapter five, and what was that supposed to be last night? Yeah, uh, which means you still get some time to do chapter five uh, homework, if I'm not mistaken. It's just that the conceptual was due last night. Anybody else? All right, well, there's a couple things I wanted to talk about just to... Uh, Part of what you should have gotten if you just read your book like you were supposed to, or if you looked at examples on my YouTube channel, or if you looked at other examples, so on and so forth, there's some things that uh, we know uh, are that you should have learned that are going to come in handy when we're talking about the chapter on gravity, which is next. So we're actually, uh, I'm actually going to do those real quick just to make sure we're all on the same page. So uh, let's go ahead and share a screen with you. And the first thing I want you to understand is uh, a typical problem. I think we even had it in, in one of our homeworks on mastering, if I remember correctly. But basically, like if you imagine you're inside of an elevator uh, car, basically. So in an elevator car, you might have A car like this oops i don't know what that that extra line was but anyways what the, uh what you could imagine is you're inside of an elevator there's a scale in the elevator and then you're standing on the elevator uh on the scale inside the elevator car and with that you're actually uh you have a mass m whoa let me do that So uh, you, you have a mass M as well. So your mass is M. I'm going to draw a free body diagram, and I'm going to draw down as the positive direction. So that's the plus Y direction. Uh, you have a mass M. Uh, the forces acting on you, of course, are your weight which equals mg and then also acting on you but in the negative direction is the force due to the scale which we normally just call a normal for force but also happens to be equal to the apparent weight in other words since it's the scale uh it's what the scale will read then the scale is telling you you your apparent weight so for part a of this problem 
I'm going to have the acceleration going downward at A, uh, and A is therefore greater than zero. And then for part B, I'm going to have the acceleration going upward, which would mean A less than zero. And then for part C, I'm going to say V equals 4.0 meters per second. Okay, those are the three parts. Now, uh, according to Newton's second law, the summation forces, I'll call this the solution. This uh, looks like I left an eye out there, but anyways, uh, the summation of forces in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. We've got mg pointing down, uh, which is the positive direction. And then we've got F scale pointing up, which is the negative direction. And all that's equal to mass times acceleration. Okay. So if we're looking at part A, then what this tells us is that Fs is equal to M. Uh, if I pull the Fs to the right-hand side, it'll become positive. And then I pull the MA to the left-hand side, it'll become negative, and I'll factor out a common M, and I'll get G minus A, like that. Uh, and since A is, in fact, greater than zero, then that means this is actually going to be less than MG. Okay, so what that tells you is when the elevator car first takes off in the downward direction, hopefully you've all noticed this before. I still do it. I'm, you know, I'm 52 years old and I, I would like to say I'm not a child anymore, but I, I'm not going to say that. Actually, I, I don't want to not be a child. <laughs> uh, so just about every time my elevator takes off in the downward direction, I still jump up because I like it. It's kind of interesting, right? Uh, what happens is because the elevator is going down, uh, you actually require a little bit less force to hold yourself up and you can actually jump up uh, quite a bit higher. I mean, I can almost do a LeBron James style jump uh, with that sort of situation when it goes down. And the reason why is my apparent weight is decreased. Or you can think of it as if not only did I jump up, which maybe I can normally, let's say, get 12 inches off the ground. Uh, but now, in addition to that 12 inches, the elevator floor has accelerated downward by maybe another three inches. So now I've got a 15 inch vertical as opposed to a 12 inch vertical. So that's one of the neat aspects that you can get. And that's one of the physical facts I wanted you to understand is that uh, when you're in accelerating reference frame uh, and you're accelerating downward, then your apparent weight is actually less than your real weight. Now, if I handle part B, If I handle part B, I still get, uh, in this case, MG minus FS is equal to MA. But in this case, the A is less than zero. So I end up getting FS is equal to M times G minus A. But A less than zero implies that uh, the force on the scale is greater than mg because it's going to be g minus negative something, which is g plus something, okay? And you can notice this if you're in an elevator. When it first takes off in the upward direction, uh, if you sort of just relax your legs a little bit where they just barely hold you up, uh, as the elevator takes off, it'll actually compress you a little bit further. So you can feel that as well. Uh, and that's what happens when something's accelerating upward is your apparent weight is higher. Another way of thinking about it is physically, the scale not only has to hold your weight up, which is mg, it's also got to provide enough force, ma, to accelerate you upward. So that's another way of thinking about it. And then finally, in part C, can anybody tell me what's going to happen? In part C, what I'm saying is the actual uh, elevator is traveling downward at a constant speed of 4.0 meters per second. So what do you think is going on there? Will the apparent weight be greater than or less than or what? Greater than. 
So, someone said greater than. Uh, that seems reasonable, but remember, uh, if you have a constant velocity, which is what four meters per second uh, is suggesting, then what you have is mg minus f scale is equal to m times zero because the acceleration is zero. So you end up getting the F time. And by the way, thank you for answering anyways. Uh, FS is actually just equal to MG. So you will get the apparent weight. Your apparent weight is equal to MG. So in other words, it, it gives you a, a correct figure. So, uh, and, and don't feel bad. Like I said, uh, I, I don't mind. In fact, it, it actually helps to be wrong. And I want, uh, in general, us as science teachers are trying to get it started where kids and students in general uh, see that it's uh, not necessarily a, ba a bad thing to get a hypothesis wrong. In fact, most of the great experimental discoveries come uh, when we make an error in our hypothesis or something along those lines. So don't feel bad about that. The main thing is, in this case, part C, the velocity was a constant, so acceleration has to be zero. Remember, acceleration is uh, non-zero when you're speeding up, R, when you're slowing down, R, when you're changing direction. Uh, this was doing none of those, so the acceleration became zero, and we got the apparent weights equal to mg. Now, what would happen, in fact, if, let's see, I'm going to call this A, part two. So what is FS if, oh, if A was in fact equal to G? So we already solved the problem before. We found that FS is equal to m times parentheses g minus a. So what is the apparent weight if a is equal to g? Zero. Yep. And that's an important concept to learn. Oh, uh, it's an important concept to learn, and a lot of people don't get it, but for instance, if you ask a lot of people uh, why the astronauts, say, in the International Space Station are weightless, they'll say because they're in space and there's no gravity in space. Uh, in principle, you can move far and far and far away from all the mass uh, in the universe and get really, really far away. And the force of gravity will be really, really small and therefore maybe not even detectable. In that sense, then yes, absolutely. If you get far enough away from all mass in the universe, then you could have a situation where it seems at least like there's no gravitational force on you. Uh, but that's not what's going on here. In the International Space Station, they actually orbit above the Earth. And in fact, they orbit uh, considerably closer to the Earth than the moon is. The moon is like 60 Earth radii away from the center of the Earth, whereas the International Space Station is more on the order of one or two Earth radii away from uh, the Earth. So clearly gravity extends beyond the International Space Station. In fact, the reason they are weightless in space is because uh, they're in free fall. So astronauts orbiting uh, the Earth are actually in free fall. They're constantly falling towards the center of the Earth, but they're falling at just the right rate so that they never get closer. OK, that's what makes it a circular orbit. If it was an elliptical orbit, and it is to some extent, uh, then sometimes they'd actually get just a little closer, but other times they get a little further away. So that's a big thing to understand is that astronauts are, in fact, weightless in space, not because of a lack of gravity, but specifically because they're in free fall. And this elevator problem uh, shows you that. Now, what I'll tell you, too, is I'll tell you the same thing I told class, uh, told the class today in lecture. For extra credit, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to remember to put a module in this week's module for extra credit, 
I want you to A, find out what uh, FS is at the North Pole. B, on the equator. C, uh, let's say at the top of Everest, what is G and D at the deepest part of the ocean G equals question mark. So uh, also let's say E G equals question mark. Uh, oh, excuse me. G equals question mark at uh, sea level. Okay, so those are some extra credit problems I want you to do. Now, the main thing that I'm wanting you to see, at least with regards to part A, B, and C, uh, or excuse me, parts A and B, is that the North Pole, you, you're you rotating about an axis going right through the center of your body, whereas at the equator, you're on the Earth, and the Earth is rotating like that. And in fact, in order for you to stay on the Earth, you have to have a certain portion of your weight going towards centripetal acceleration. That's what I'm trying to hint at here, is uh, you're not just standing there. It's almost like you're uh, doing uh, the same thing we did in the elevator car. We're accelerating towards the center of the Earth when you're on the equator. And that much is given, or that acceleration is given by V squared over R. So you can find your apparent weight on the equator and you should be able to figure out that you're actually gonna lose a little weight, okay? Any questions on that? All right, now that I got that, uh, I wanted to, let me see, was there something else? Oh yeah, there's one more part that I wanted to make sure you guys understood, and that is uh, basically terminal velocity and uh, air resistance or air drag is another thing they call, uh, say. So they'll say F drag is a drag force. And basically it's either proportional to velocity R is proportional to velocity squared. We're going to handle the velocity part as opposed to the velocity squared part. So what we're going to say is for this particular problem, the drag is negative B times V. Okay. I am going to draw a coordinate system again where down is the positive direction. So that's going to be plus Y is down. I'm going to have a mass M, and of course, that mass M will cause a force towards the center of the Earth equal to the weight, which equals Mg, okay? Now, in addition to that, you're going to have uh, some forces trying to slow it down, one of which is called a buoyant force. And I literally mean just like when you submerge a ball underwater, uh, it tries to come back up. And the reason why is something called Archimedes principle, which basically says that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. So uh, I'll give you a little explanation of that. But that part's gonna be quite small. Then there's another part that actually can be quite big and that's F drag is equal to negative BV. Now the F buoyant part is actually gonna be equal to negative. And if you take the density of air 
And uh, some of you might recall this from grade school or high school or whatever. Uh, here in grade school, they use this little heart as a mnemonic to remember density. So you see that density is mass over volume, the M over the V. So that means if you multiply the, the density times the volume, then uh, you'll actually get the mass. So if I multiply this by the volume of the mass M, then rho times V just gives me the mass of air that would otherwise replace the mass M. So then if I multiply that by gravitational acceleration, that gives me how much the air that the ball moved out of the way weighs. Okay, it turns out that's exactly what Archimedes principle tells us is that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Uh, a typical way of showing that, and it's kind of neat, I'll, I'll simplify it real quick, but basically we have these cool cups that we can use uh, for our labs. And these cool cups basically look like this. And what they have is a little hole in the side and it's got a little spout that comes out sort of level, if you will, like this. And if you take and fill it up with water all the way, say to here, Uh, then it's going to drain until the water gets basically to here. Okay. Now, once it's drained, then that means it's as full as it can be. And if you add, you know, even a, a, a flea to that water, a volume of water is going to pour out the side equal in volume to the volume of the flea. So when you do that, uh, after you've got it leveled off like this, then you can take and submerge a block. Whoa, no, that didn't turn out good at all. Back here, okay. You can take and submerge a block. And while it's submerged, you can weigh it. OK, and then you can also weigh it while it's not submerged. And what you'll figure out is the weight minus the weight submerged is equal to uh, some quantity called the buoyant force. So what you do is when you submerge this thing, you have another little cup here that's going to catch the water. And it's a cup whose mass you already know. So once it fills up, you weigh the water. Actually, that turned out really bad. Let me rewrite that. Now, this is the second overflow, not the first one. The first one, you just overflowed it so that it would level out to the level of the little spout. That water, we just let throw, uh, throw it away. We don't need it, right? But... The second time around, when I actually submerge the thing, I actually catch all that water and then weigh it. And what I'll find is the weight of the overflow is equal to the buoyant force. So, for instance, if uh, the weight was, let's say, 3.00 kilograms, uh, well, actually, it has to be 3.00 kilograms times 9.80 meters per second every second and you found that the uh, weight of the overflow is equal to uh, 0 0.53 kilograms again times 9.80 meters per second per second then the weight minus weight submerged, or I should say, the weight submerged would equal 2.47 kilograms times 9.80 
meters per second every second. So that's really what would happen with the buoyant force, okay? Uh, so in, in principle, whenever anything's falling, you not only have air drag that can act on it, you also have a potential buoyant force even in the air. And really, if you take, uh, once you go through the fluid mechanics chapter, which we skip in this course because we know the students that actually need fluid mechanics are likely going to get it from their engineering classes so uh, and, and get a much better uh, case of it. So we usually don't even cover it in, in the physics class. So uh, we don't cover that, but you can. And in fact, I give extra credit for those of you who do do it. Uh, but when you actually cover Archimedes principle, you can actually show that the buoyant force is specifically there because the uh, pressure due to gravity of the fluid that you're in, whether it be atmospheric air or water in a swimming pool, the pressure at the bottom is higher than the pressure at the top. And that actually is the cause of the buoyant force. Uh, specifically, you can think of it this way. If you're at the bottom of the pool, uh, there's maybe a column of water one inch by one inch by eight feet on top of you. Whereas if you're just, say, uh, one foot below, then there's only a column of one inch by one inch by one foot. So clearly, there's less force downward on you than there is upward. And that's what the buoyant force comes from. OK, so in our particular case, where we're talking about an object falling, as you might suspect, especially when it starts to go so fast that it might reach its terminal velocity, we're going to say that the drag force is way, way bigger than the buoyant force. So conclude F drag is way, way greater than F buoyant. And you also could say that the weight is way, way, way greater than F buoyant as well. So you really don't have to do much with it. So that being said, Newton's second law gives us this. We're going to say the force, which is mg acting downward, minus bv is equal to m times dv dt. Remember, this is Newton's second law, and acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. Now, I'm going to divide both sides by g. And when I do so, I will get g minus b over, or excuse me, both sides by m, not, not g. I don't know what I was thinking. both sides by M, I'll get G over, I mean, minus B over M times V is equal to DV DT. Now I'm going to write this as DV over G minus B over M times V is equal to dt. Now I'm going to integrate from v equals zero to v of t, meaning v is a function of t, and I'm going to integrate this side from t equals zero to t. Now in order to do so, the left hand side needs a little bit of work, so I'm going to say let u equal g minus b over m times v, then du is equal to negative b over m dv, or or Uh, dv is equal to negative m over b du. So I can take the dv that I already got and just replace that with negative m over b. So I'm going to say, notice this side right here is just going to become t. So I'm going to say t is equal to negative m over b times the integral of du over u. That is going to give me, of course, 
T, and actually I'll do it like this. I'll say B negative B of M times T is equal to the natural log of G minus B over M V of T over just plain G. So what happened there is the integral of du over u is just the natural log. But I had to evaluate it first at v equals v of t. So I got the ln of g minus b over m vt minus the ln of just plain g. And of course, if you do the ln minus the ln, that's the same thing as the ln of the first argument divided by the second argument. So that's why they're stacked on top of each other. Now, I'm going to make all the mathematicians in the world vomit a little bit in their mouth by raising e to the left-hand side power and then raising e to the right-hand side power. And of course, that's going to give us something nice. Specifically, it's going to give us that g minus, well, actually, I'll write it a different way. That's going to give me, I'm going to multiply through by g first. So then I'm going to get G minus B over M, oops, V of T is equal to G times E to the negative B over M times T like that. Did I make sure, did I copy that right? Let me see, I took that, I got uh, DV. I'm checking my where I let uh, u equal g minus b over m times v. So then dv became negative m over b, negative m over b, and then that became b over m on the other side. Okay, yeah, so it looks like it's okay. Now what I'm going to do is add b over m times vt to both sides and subtract g times the exponential from both sides. And when I do that, I'll get b over m v of t is equal to g times one minus e to the negative b over m t. Or finally, I can say that v as a function of time is equal to m g over b times one minus e to the negative b over m times t and I'll switch this off to a square bracket. So that is the actual velocity as a function of time for an object that is experiencing air drag. And in fact, if you look at it, I, I recommend, in fact, I did it for my class today, I let M be one. And let B equal 2.00 and of course the units for b would actually be newton seconds per meter uh and then i just put it into desmos and when you do that what you see is you get a nice little graph that looks like this and it's asymptotically approaching basically m uh, all right, it's approaching V equals MG over B. That's why asymptotically it's approaching. So that's kind of a, a neat little exercise. And it's sort of the last thing that I wanted to make sure I covered for you, even though I've done this on my YouTube channel and you've got plenty of examples. Uh, anybody have any questions on that? Could you raise the sheet? Um, my screen's covering the bottom of it. Oh, okay, gotcha. Like Thank you. Like, there you go. There's probably a way I can do that better, but did you get what you needed? <laughs> could you could you put it back? <laughs> Let me see. How about that? Uh, Thank you. Hold on. Just give me one. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to make it as big as I can. There you go. I got it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, all right. So we did uh, we did cover that. Now, what I want to go into is now gravity. And I've sort of alluded to this stuff before, 
But basically what happened with gravity is, and, and Newton published this in his Principia, uh, remember, in, uh, it was written in Latin, and Latin has no soft C, so it's not Principia. Uh, it's got to be Principia. But the main thing is, this is a big Latin book, and he basically stated his three laws of motion, the first of which really, like I said, was Galileo's law of inertia, the third of which uh, even Leonardo da Vinci had found, and the second one was his original work, mostly, and that was basically that an object will accelerate and that acceleration will be directly proportional to the total force and, in fact, parallel to the total force and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. And he introduced gravity. And basically, as the story goes, he was sitting under an apple tree in his mother's apple orchard when he looked up and saw an apple and in the distance saw the moon and realized that they might be very, very similar meaning the uh, same force that will eventually pull a nice juicy succulent apple out of a tree down to the ground might very well be the same force that pulls the moon out of its straight line path, according to Newton's first law of motion, into a circular orbit. And he said, well, if that's the case, I wonder how they're related. And of course, he had been studying optics as well, and uh, in optics, we learned that light, uh, the brightness or the intensity of light falls off like one over distance squared, meaning if you're, you know, uh, let's say 10 meters away from a light bulb, at 10 meters, a light bulb is basically a point object. It's really small. So if you took the brightness that you get there, which is the total energy per unit area, so maybe the total number of photons or the total number of watts that fall on a postage stamp, for instance, you'd take that that energy or that power in watts and divide it by the, the area of the postage stamp, and that would give you the intensity of the, of the light. Now, if you go from 10 meters away from the light bulb to 20 meters, you've doubled the distance. And what we discovered with light is that actually causes the intensity not to go down by a factor of two, but to go down by a factor of two squared, which is four. If you went to 30 meters, it'd go down by three squared, which is nine. If you went to 40 meters, it'd go down by uh, four squared, which is 16. If you went to 50 meters, it'd go down by 25, so on and so forth. So he said, I wonder if this gravity thing, uh, which of course he didn't gra call it gravity yet, but still, I wonder if this thing behaves the same way as light. And what he did was you can take V squared over R, which we just learned about last chapter, and calculate that for the moon, realizing that the moon takes about 30 days to complete one orbit around the Earth. And notice that the uh, and realize that the distance from the center of the Earth to the center of the moon is about 60 Earth radii. Whereas the distance from the center of the Earth to the apples, one Earth radius. So you would conclude, in fact, that uh, it's 60 times farther away uh, for the moon than it is for an apple. So when he calculated V squared over R for the moon, he got uh, 0.00272. Then when he took 9.8 and divided it by 60 squared, he got 0.00272. And at that instant, Newton is the only person on planet Earth that understands not only why the moon happens to be orbiting our Earth, but also why Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, which they didn't know about Uranus, Neptune, or Pluto yet, but why they're all orbiting around the sun. And in fact, why the Galilean moons, which were originally called the Medician moons, were orbiting around Jupiter. Okay. So that was his big conquest, was uh, figuring out gravity. And he knew there was problems. He, he said, I cannot understand how a uh, force could reach across space, say from our sun, and grab a hold of a planet without it having a physical tether. He said, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I know I can solve problems with this scenario and maybe some other generation maybe will figure out exactly why this is the case. And that's exactly... Uh, what happened with electricity and magnetism, and ultimately it's exactly the problem that Einstein tried to solve with his gravity, 
uh, which turns out as best we can figure out is correct. And in, in fact, was again, most recently, even though he published it in 1915, the general theory of relativity was yet confirmed again with three major conf uh, confirmations of what Einstein predicted happening literally a hundred years later. In other words, in 2015, uh, we discovered two black holes colliding. Uh, one, that was a prediction of black holes that came from general theory of relativity. Two, uh, that they collide and obey Newton's second law, or excuse me, uh, Einstein's laws of gravity, uh, because we saw exactly what we had predicted to see. That was another confirmation of Einstein's general relativity. And then thirdly, they were putting off gravitational radiation and that was the first time we'd ever seen gravitational radiation, which was indeed predicted by Einstein's general theory of relativity. OK, so that's what it was. Now, what ultimately came of it is uh, and, and of course, vectors didn't exist at this time. Vectors were not something that Newton understood or knew about, but uh, he still had an idea that forces not only mattered uh, in terms of how big they were, but what direction they were going. And what he found was that the force of gravity was equal to some constant G called the gravitational constant. I'm not sharing your screen. Oh, yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> what he found was that the force of gravity is, in fact, proportional to the product of the masses. And the constant of proportionality is the universal gravitational constant, big G is proportional to the product of the masses, m1, m2, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Now, uh, experimentally, we found that this g is, in fact, 0 0.0000000067 newtons times meters squared per kilogram squared, which obviously we don't normally write that way. I just wanted you to get a feel for how small that constant is. It's 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. Whoa, why did I write 17? 10 to the negative 11th Newtons meter squared per kilogram squared. So that's the gravitational constant. And what he said was that the force is always attractive. And acts along the line from the center of mass of M1 to the center of mass of M2. So in other words, he's really given us enough to make a vector out of it, even though vectors didn't exist at the time. Now, for some perspective, I will tell you that Coulomb came up with a similar law for electricity. And I shouldn't just say Coulomb. In fact, we found there's uh, several people that, that did this. Uh, Coulomb, uh, Ben Franklin, and I can't recall the last person's name, but either way, all of them came up with this sort of simultaneously. But what they found was the force was proportional to the product of the charges, Q1 and Q2, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. But here's the kicker. K, in this case, is 9... Uh, zero, 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 Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. So you can see one is like 10 to the negative 11th and the other one's like 10 to the ninth. So just looking at those two, you'd say, okay, well, the electric force must be roughly one followed by 20 zeros times bigger. And you'd be pretty correct. In fact, it's even worse. Like if you compare the gravitational attraction between a proton and the electron and a hydrogen atom and the electric 
attraction between the proton and the electron in a hydrogen atom, uh, that turns out to be more like one followed by, I can't remember, it might even be like 40 zeros after it. So it's much, much bigger. So that's Newton's law of gravity. Uh, you can use this to calculate forces. In fact, your book even takes the time to give it to you in a, a vector way. So I'm going to do that real quick. It's kind of nice. So if I draw a coordinate system like this, where this is my x-axis, this is my y-axis, and this is my z-axis, then what I might find is this would be mass M1, say, and this would be mass M2, say. There's a vector right here called R2, and there's a vector right here called R1, right? And there's a force, let's say F, 1, 2, with a vector symbol on it. And that means the force on M1 due to M2, okay? So we know it's attractive, so what we know for a fact is that the force on M2, on M1, should point this way. In other words, along the line connecting the center of masses. And in fact, we call this vector R21, which if you look at it, you can see is R2 minus R1. So that makes it make a little bit more sense. So if you want to finish out this equation, what you're going to do is you're going to write the G here the M1, the M2 over R21, notice the length of that vector is in fact equal to the distance between them. Now, if I just put a square down there, that would be fine. But then if I wrote R21 to the right of it, then that would reduce the division by R squared to a division by R. So in fact, it's uh, smarter to say, R21 with a hat on top of it and do squared there. Does anybody recall what the hat means on the R21? It means it's a vector, right? It does mean it's a vector, but a very specific type of vector. Do you remember what the hat part means? Unit vector. It's a unit vector, exactly. So R21 hat is actually equal to the vector R21 divided by the magnitude of the vector R21. So you can also write this as G M1 M2 over R21 cubed R21. And then that way you can write it as a regular vector. Okay. Now, you're probably never going to need to do that, uh, at least not in this course. But if you're dealing with a lot of problems or if you're writing computer code, having such a succinct formula can be very helpful. But if you're just doing one or two masses, it's crazy to use it. So don't bother. All right. But that is a vector version of it. Now, uh, what I what I want to show you about gravity here is gravity is a force and it's called the universal law of gravitation. And now when Einstein comes on the scene, he actually says, I don't like this idea of action at a distance, which is what Newton's law of gravity is. It literally is uh, the sun is acting on something some distance away without being connected to it. So the first thing they try is they introduce something like a field like you know from Star Wars and Star Trek and other science fiction uh, things uh, where you have fields, like you could have a temperature field where you take every X, Y, Z, say in space, every point X comma Y comma Z in parentheses, and you assign to it the actual temperature it has at that point, that would be the temperature field. And uh, that's in fact a scalar field because it just has a magnitude down the direction. Uh, you could also assign to every X, Y, and Z point in space a vector, in which case that'd be a vector field. So uh, they first tried doing that with gravity. It didn't really work that well. 
uh, Einstein had to go another way. So what Einstein imagined was first, let's imagine the laws of physics without things that seem to violate Newton's first law of motion, which is an object in motion tends to stay in that state of motion unless acted upon by a net external force. Now, if you stuck a bowling ball or a basketball on a merry-go-round and you attach the video camera to that merry-go-round where it could only see the ball in the merry-go-round and you spun it, the video camera would catch a ball sitting there perfectly still and then all of a sudden shooting out the side of the screen and you would it would look as if Newton's first law of motion had been violated. Einstein saying, hey, if you see something like that, that is a violation of Newton's law or Galileo's law of inertia, of inertia, and that's what we call a non-inertial reference frame. So he said all the planets, for instance, doing what they're doing is an example of a non-inertial reference frame. So he got rid of that and developed his special relativity to cover everything except for those weird cases. And then later what he said was, uh, okay, so it turns out that the laws of physics are the same for all observers. Uh, the speed of light is a constant, independent of the motion of the source and independent of the motion of the observer. And then thirdly, what we basically discovered was that uh, matter can't really tell the difference, at least on a small scale, between an elevator accelerating upward and gravitational acceleration pulling downward. Okay. Now, if it was a big enough elevator, so let me show you a little example of what I mean there. Imagine this is the earth and this is the elevator shaft. Okay. If it's a small elevator, then I can drop two balls and they both seem to go down uh, parallel to each other. And that's true whether it's because of gravity of the earth or if it's because that elevator is being accelerated upward with a really quiet jet engine. Now, if you take a large elevator, then this one, according to gravity, is going to fall this way and that one's going to fall that way. So you can see that clearly that's a gravitational acceleration. Whereas if you were in an elevator car that was shooting upward, then what would happen is this ball would go straight down and this ball would go straight down and both of these two balls would go straight down. That's what he meant. And with that, he was able to figure out that in some sense, the universe is four dimensional. It has left, right. It has in, out. Notice those are perpendicular to each other. It has up, down. All three of those are perpendicular to each other. And then it has a time dimension. And in that four dimensions, it turns out space is not quite flat. It's sort of puckered. And gravity uh, is really space, which is not flat, telling matter how to move. And matter is telling space how to bend, and that's what the general theory of relativity is, okay? That's about all you need for that right now, but I just wanted to let you know that uh, that's really where it comes from. Now, the universe, or where it goes to, I should say. Now, the fact that it's called the universal law of gravitation is for a couple of reasons. First off, uh, any two masses... experience gravity. In other words, in other words, the entire universe experiences gravity because if you find any two things that have mass, then they're going to have a gravitational attraction to one another. And another reason is too, there is no R such that the gravitational force equals zero. So in some sense, the, the force of gravity reaches across the entire universe. It's universal because it applies to all masses, and it's universal because it reaches across the entire universe. There's no R you can put in that equation for Newton's law of gravity that gives you a force of zero. So it really does reach across the universe, and they call it the master of the universe. Uh, as you can tell, it's still way weaker than the electric force. But the big thing is the vast majority of matter, as best we can tell, has no charge on it. 
whereas the uh, vast majority of what we thought matter was has mass. Uh, sadly, it turns out in the last couple decades, we've discovered that there's something called dark matter. That dark matter uh, we predict or we think is causing the speed of the stars orbiting galaxies to not decrease as rapidly as we expect them to be. In other words, the speed they orbit through the center around the, around the center of their galaxy should decrease the farther and farther out you get. And they do, but they don't decrease nearly enough. So it's like there's some extra matter in there that's making them uh, behave weirdly. So we called that dark uh, matter. And then also we discovered not only that the universe is expanding, which Hubble, uh, you know, Hubble in the early 1900s was the first one to discover that there were other islands of stars that we now call galaxies. In fact, it was just called the Andromeda Nebula then. And then he discovered that was a whole nother island of stars because his telescope was big enough to tell. And that island of stars uh, meant the universe was a lot bigger than we thought and that they were all running away from us because the universe is expanding. So some time ago, we discovered that not only is the universe expanding, but it's actually speeding up. So we went from being very cocky and very uh, awesome in that we knew we understood nature. We understood the microscopic with our quantum mechanics and our quantum electrodynamics. We understood the macroscopic uh, with Newton's laws of motion and the very big with uh, Einstein's general and special theories of relativity, uh, understood the very fast. We understood optics, we understood waves. We really, really understood just about everything. And it seemed really great. And then all of a sudden we discovered dark matter and dark energy. And it turns out that we now understand about 2% of the universe because it appears if, if we're right about dark matter and dark energy doing all that they do, and it's not just a matter of us not quite getting gravity right yet, uh, then the 98% uh, of everything that exists in nature is stuff that we don't understand at all because the stuff that we understand is only stuff made of photons, which are massless, and made of massive particles like quarks and uh, leptons like the proton and the muon and stuff like that, or excuse me, the pion and stuff like that. Uh, so now we're in a predicament where we only understand how things behave for about 2% of them. All right, any questions on that? All right, so a couple things that happens from this. Now that we know gravity, we also know that gravity is responsible for what we call weight. So we can say that Newton's law of gravity, G times your mass times the mass of the earth. And this is the, that's the little subscript they put on M when they're talking about the mass of the earth. If they're talking about the sun, they'll put a circle with a, a dot in the middle for obvious reasons. And that all divided by the radius of the Earth squared. And the reason why we say that is basically for most altitudes, even you know the altitude of Mount Everest, for instance, uh, that distance from the Earth's surface to the top of Mount Everest is a small, small, small fraction of the radius of the Earth. So you might as well call it equal to the radius of the Earth. In fact, check this out. Uh, if you take a basketball and you measure the height of one of the pimples on the basketball, you know, those little dots that stand up to give you a little bit of grip. And then you measure the depth of the hole, the little seams that are around it, and you add those up to make a really, you know, as big a distance as you possibly can to deviate from the radius of the, of the uh, basketball. If you take that total distance, the depth of the, uh, the depth of the seam plus the height of the pimple, and divide that by the radius of the basketball, you get a larger number than if you add the height of Mount Everest to the depth of the Marianas Trench and divide that by the radius of the Earth. In other words, the Earth is more perfectly spherical even than a basketball. So that's kind of crazy. But all right, now back to that. So we know that this gravitational force is what's responsible for our weight. And we also know our weight is mg. So from that, we can see that gravitational acceleration should be equal to 
the universal gravitational constant, big G, times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth squared. Okay. Now, what I was asking you to do in the extra credit on two previous pages, this one, or excuse me, the third period, the, this down here is don't use the radius of the Earth. Use the radius of the Earth plus the height of Mount Everest. And don't use the radius of the Earth. Use the radius of the Earth minus the depth of the Marianas Trench or whatever the deepest part of the ocean is. Okay. So that's what I was talking about there. And but this should give you 9.80 meters per second per second. So that's something kind of neat to, to figure out is now we know what G is and where it came from. And in fact, if you were to take G instead of at the radius of the Earth, but instead put 60 Earth radii, you would get G equals 0 0.00272 meters per second per second, which was the figure that Newton came up with. Okay. Now. Wait, you said big G is gravity, correct? Big G is gravitational, uh, the universal gravitational constant, the 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. Let me put that up here just to remind you. So that's what that one is. The lowercase g is 9.80. All right. So now uh, we know something about gravity. You can use this by realizing uh, that the magnitude of any vector force between any two objects is just g times m times m over the distance between them squared. That'll get you the size of the force. And then, of course, you can put the forces in any or the masses in any kind of configuration in space and then add them like vectors to get, for instance, the total force of gravity. Let's say, for instance, if you had a mass here and a mass here and a mass here, you might want to know the total force on this one due to these two. Well, obviously, this one causes a force that way. Uh, this one to the left causes a force that way. Uh, you can figure out what that angle is, but you know the magnitudes and you can just do your uh, vector analysis or your vector addition to figure out what the force is. That's pretty straightforward. But let me show you that we can, in fact, start to make sense of Kepler's laws. So Kepler, in fact, was given the onus of figuring out uh, basically why the universe was working the way it was. So in the time of the ancient Greeks, uh, they had actually considered the idea of a heliocentric model of the universe. And for them, the ancient Greeks and up through uh, up until the late 1800s, early 1900s, when you said universe, you meant the sun, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Ur uh, not even Uranus and Neptune yes, necessarily or Pluto yet, uh, the moon, the asteroid belt. Uh, they didn't really have any idea of the Kuiper belt yet, uh, and about a couple thousand stars. That was the entire universe up until, like I said, maybe as late as 1904 or something like that. So that was the universe. Uh, and Exagoras at, uh, from ancient Greece had actually uh, suggested that perhaps the sun was the center, but if the sun was the center, then they argued that when the Earth was over here on this side of the sun and it saw this nearby star, it would say this nearby star looks like it's in front of these stars. But when the Earth came back to this side of the sun, it would argue that star has now moved and you'd see some, some of the nearest stars move back and forth from year to year or from six month period to six month period. And they didn't detect that. Because they didn't detect that, they said one of two things must be happening. One, either the universe is ginormous, which they could not imagine it being that big, or two, uh, the, uh, the Earth is at the center and not moving. That's why we don't see it. So they went with the second choice, and uh, Eudoxus and the Pythagoreans and ultimately 
uh, Ptolemy and, and Aristotle, and all these people made models of the universe. And the models of the universe basically were all written in terms of what Aristotle ultimately uh, decided, which was we imagined that the earth was the center. And we had this weird thing that happened, like uh, you would go out, say, tonight, and you'd look and you'd find some stars in the sky that look like this. And if you came out tomorrow night, you'd find that same collection of stars and tomorrow night, the same collection of stars. But each night they'd be in a slightly different location, but still the same shape and general size. And in fact, if you waited about four or five months, they'd be gone. You wouldn't see them again. You weren't sharing your stream. Oh, yeah, that, that might help, wouldn't it? <laughs> I forgot. I don't even know why, uh, why I stopped uh, showing it. Oh, I remember. I was going to make a face or something. <laughs> so anyways, yes, yes here, here is the screen that I'm not sharing. So uh, you see those little blue dots that I drew over here? OK, so it turns out that that shape will appear in the sky, uh, let's say, February of every year. And they all look about the same every year. And that's kind of cool. And in fact, there's a bunch of other shapes that look just like it. And not only that, you can go back to data from ancient Egypt and they had pictures that look just the same. So we know even on the time scale of thousands of years, uh, the shapes of these things that change. So they actually imagine that the universe was, in fact, geocentric. It had a earth at the center. And then it had, of course, the four elements, earth, wind, fire, and water. That was Aristotle's explanation of why things moved the way they did. Their move, movement was either violent or natural, Violent motion had to be sustained with a constant force pushing it, whereas natural motion didn't have to be sustained at all and was just, for instance, earth material trying to get back towards the center of the earth because, yes, Aristotle did know the earth was a sphere. Uh, water slightly above the earth, but still uh, close to the earth, so it was trying to get there. Smoke was part earth and part air, so it would try to get up in the air, but not quite as rapidly as other things. Flames or fire uh, might be like the sun, so they expect it to get above the atmosphere, that sort of thing. And then the fifth element, which was Mila Jovovich, uh, <laughs> was called the quintessence and was the heavens, okay? And in the heavens, the heavens had certain laws that Aristotle took as obvious, like the heavens are perfect. The perfect shape is the sphere. Ergo, the perfect shape is the sphere, and that can be the only shape that would exist in the heavens, or perhaps a circle if you're talking two dimensions. So he, could, he combined all that junk to come up with the idea that uh, the Earth being the center wasn't sufficient but that all the objects had to orbit it in uh, spherical shells, if you will. And in fact, the center was the Earth, and centered on that was a ginormous crystalline sphere, outside of which was fire. And in fact, this little collection of blue stars right here, uh, those were actually holes in the crystalline sphere that allowed the sun to shine through it, or excuse me, allowed the fire behind it to shine through it. And that's why you'd even see twinkling. So uh, basically what they were suggesting was that the reason these shapes always look the same is because they were literally holes in a giant crystalline sphere centered on the earth. And it just rotated slowly uh, so that you'd see that in the same location about once every year. Well, that was all well and good until this happens. Once you start watching it long enough, you realize, okay, well, hey, what's this? Wait, wait, what, what's going on? I see it. I see something else in there. I'll, something is, in fact, wandering through. And as it's wandering through, it actually starts to go the opposite direction and gets brighter. And in fact, they named them the planetos because planetos meant wanderer. 
because they appeared to wander through the other stars, okay? Other than that, everything was like a giant crystal sphere. So to make sense of that, what they would do is they would draw a deferent, which would be, let's say, an orbit like this. But then on that orbit, they would draw an epicycle. And then on that epicycle, they would imagine as a planet, in this case, it's Mercury. Okay? Now, this thing, the center right here, in most cases, would act, the center of the circle, this one that I'm drawing right now, would actually orbit around the Earth, and then the planet Mercury would orbit around the second circle. Uh, that's not the case with Mercury and Venus, but with all the other planets, it would be. Now, Venus had a similar setup, but because Venus actually got farther from the sun than did Mercury, they had a bigger epicycle, and Venus would say be here, okay? And in fact, there had to be an imaginary line that went through the center of those epicycles and into the center of the sun. So that was kind of crazy, but you can see by these things rotating back and forth through here, that can account for the loop that we saw and the fact that they get closer, say, when Venus is here, it's brighter than when Venus is here. So it explains all that. Then outside of the sun's orbit was, in fact, another orbit, and that would have an epicycle as well, and that would, in fact, be Mars. And then outside of that was another epicycle and another deferent. And then, of course, that would be Jupiter. And then again, Saturn. So that was the model of the universe. And uh, it was working fine. I mean, you could literally predict planets decades in advance. And that's what astronomers were paid for. The government needed certain dates to be predicted. Like there was a lot of things that were related to the seasons uh, even Easter, for instance, if you notice, Easter doesn't happen on the same day or the same date of every year. Neither does Thanksgiving, for that matter, because Thanksgiving happens on Thursdays and uh, Easter happens on Sundays. Uh, but basically, they have constellation or uh, astronomical dates, and you have to predict those things. Not only that, they believed in the pseudoscience that was astrology, so they wanted astrologically favorable conditions to do certain things. So astronomers made up these tables that would give them ideas of where all the planets were and what constellations at what time of year. And that was the major model of the universe. Well, Kepler one day was thinking a bit about the universe and realized that there were uh, exactly the same number of perfect solids as would take to separate the Earth from each of the planets. So the Earth, or excuse me, the Sun from each of the planets, the Sun from Mercury, then between Mercury and Venus, another perfect solid, and then from Venus to uh, the Earth, say, was another perfect solid, from the Earth to Mars, say, was another perfect solid, from Mars to Jupiter was another perfect solid, and then from Jupiter to Saturn was another perfect solid. So he started doing calculations and sent it to anybody that would listen, one person of which was a guy by the name of Tio Brahe, uh, a Dane, a person from Denmark, uh, who had a knack of getting people to give him money and specifically royalty. They gave him a whole island called Hvin or something. It's got like 18 consonants. It's like H-V-V-V-E-N or something. Anyways, they gave him this whole island and told him that he could collect the rents from the people that live there and use that for his scientific discovery. He was not a nice landlord, uh, and in fact, he didn't even have a nose because he got in a sword fight over who was the better mathematician, and the guy cut his nose off, so he had a silver and gold and uh, nose, prosthetic nose, they would stick to his face with wax, and he was sort of a Russell Brand type character, if y'all go know, get him from the, uh, get him to the Greek, or forgetting Sarah Marshall, or the first husband of Katy Perry. Uh, he's sort of this wild and crazy party guy 
And then Kepler, on the other hand, is sort of the really super straight lace, doesn't, you know, doesn't stay up late, doesn't party, doesn't drink, doesn't do any of that kind of stuff. He's sort of the Mike Pence, if you will, of, of good people. And you put uh, those two together, which is what happens, Brahe hires him and Kepler comes there and tries to work. Well, quickly, Brahe discovers that this guy might steal his thunder. So he starts feeding him the data very slowly. Uh, in the meantime, Brahe happens to, you know, throw parties that are so bad that a, a, once a huge deer fell down the, the steps because they got him drunk, but he so drunk that he fell down the steps and, and broke its neck. Uh, he had a pet human, which we would call a little person. Uh, he was not that good of a person, honestly. Uh, Brahe wasn't. But one day he partied so long and he was such nobility that he didn't want people to understand or know that he actually had to go pee or poo or anything like that. So he sat there so long that his bladder burst and he ended up get, becoming septic and died. Uh, that obviously caused a shortage in, in Kepler's research, but luckily Kepler took it to court and was able to win the data. Uh, Kepler, uh, finally took the data and made up his three laws of planetary motion and he he nailed it he got it perfectly right and much to his credit he gave all the credit to Brahe which is a big problem that the family was worried about is he realized how good Tycho Brahe's data was without a telescope the telescopes hadn't been invented yet Brahe just had a really big big protractor and he would use that to locate and a very good timing device and he'd use those to locate where astronomical bodies were. And uh, Kepler knew his data was so good that he made very specific decisions based on that. And in doing so, he figured out that his model was crap. He had to throw it away. He took uh, Brahe's model, which was basically the same as this one that you're seeing here, except imagine uh, all the planets orbiting the Earth except now take that earth and make it orbit the sun. <laughs> so, so that was that was Tycho Brahe's model. Uh, that was just a nightmare. And in fact, Galileo knew that when he uh, argued the, uh, uh, for the Copernican model, uh, even though that would completely shoot his stuff in the, uh, uh, shoot it down because uh, Galileo had very specific telescopic data that, that contradicted uh, the, the pre-Copernican model and uh, Brahe's model would in fact support uh, both cases. So he just pretended like he didn't know that. But either way, ultimately Kepler says, one, the planets orbit the sun in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focal point. That would have Aristotle going crazy. An ellipse is like a bastardized circle. So that's not cool at all uh, for, for uh, Aristotle. Two, they would sweep out equal areas and equal times. That meant the planets actually sped up and slowed down. Uh, one of the arguments that Aristotle held was that the heavens were immutable. They wouldn't change. So because if they changed, they changed from perfection to imperfection, which isn't acceptable, or they went the other way. So that wasn't a case. And then thirdly, the square of the period of the orbit was proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. That was Kepler's third law. Newton's law, when Newton comes along with gravity, he's able to prove all three of those laws as ramifications of his law of gravity. And we'll finish up with that next time. Uh, that's it. Class is over. It's 640 now. Uh, anybody has any questions, you're welcome to stay. We will finish this up next time, uh, but you should be able to get quite a bit of homework done by this uh, already. So let me know if you have any questions. I'll be waiting here for the last person to leave. I'm going to stop sharing. Does someone need to see anything before I stop sharing the screen? Are you extending the homework for uh, uh, chapter five or is it due today? Uh, chapter five, it, the concepts are, uh, the concept questions were due last night, I think. And uh, yeah, I'm good on that one. I think the, the homework itself is due today or tomorrow. Yeah, I think it's due tomorrow. I think, I think I'm fine with chapter five being due tomorrow. Uh, let me double check, just make sure that is what it is. I think if it's due tonight, that wouldn't be cool. But if it's due tomorrow, I'm okay with that. Let's see. And remember, you can always do it late for partial credit. Uh, let's see. Assignments. Yeah, chapter five. 
is due waiting for it it's to tomorrow. Load. Yeah, that's tomorrow. Uh, no, I'm going to go ahead and change that right now. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to change chapter five to be due. Uh, actually, I'm going to change them both to be due the 26th. Now, don't get too cocky with that because chapter six is also due on the 26th. So I don't want you going crazy. Yeah. But mm -hmm. anyways, that should do it. Have a good night. All right. Have a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Younger. Yes. Uh, what are good times to meet you in person and ask you questions? Okay. So I'm there every Monday and Wednesday. I get there by usually by 730. I can even be there as early as seven. And then my class doesn't start till nine. But in addition to yeah, that, Monday and Wednesday at 9 a.m., I have labs. So by 10 a.m., uh, I'm basically free to answer questions. So you can catch me in the lab right across from my office. There's two labs, 20, JC21 and JC26. You can catch me in either one of those, uh, like I said, 10, 1030 or later. Okay. Um, wait, what about the earlier times? Is that still good, too? Yes, yes. So uh, it, that's also available, like I said, from 730 till 9 on Mondays and Wednesdays and from about 10, 1030 to uh, noon on Mondays and Wednesdays. And when I could I go ahead. when could I meet you? Uh, where do I where could I meet you at the 730 to 9 a.m.? Uh, that would be in JC24, which is my office. And then for the 10 a.m. to noon would be. JC21 or JC26, depending on whether it's Monday or Wednesday. And they're literally right across. So you'll see me in the room or whatever. So it's not like it, you won't be able to find me. You'll probably hear my mouth or something. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No um, hey, you might want to make a reservation just in case because, you know, I'm a family guy. So if one of my, if my wife or my kids get sick and I have to cancel, if I know you're coming, I can at least call and say, Hey, I'm not going to be able to be there and save you a trip. But, uh, you don't have to make an appointment, just that would be a little more convenient for you in case something happened. Well, okay, I'll keep that in mind. Where would I be able to make those appointments? Uh, JC21, uh, excuse me, JC24, and then JC, oh, as far as appointments, you just send me an email or text me or something like that. Okay. okay. Uh, hopefully see you on Wednesday morning. Yeah, I'll be there. All right, have a good one. You too, see ya. Anybody else? Looks like Carter's still here. Carter, do you have any questions? All right, I'm gonna call it a day then. Have a good one.